Welcome to Live at Kigali 2022. My name is Vidisha and I'm joined here by two very interesting people to talk about health equity in the post-pandemic world. Um, so just brief introductions to my two co-panelists here. Um, Eliani is um, a doctoral student at Harvard University and she's also the co-founder of Yakin. Eliani, do you want to tell us a little bit about Yakin? Yes, I'm actually a survivor of child sexual abuse and I set up the nonprofit in 2015 to fulfill a vow I made when I was 17 to help give a voice to those who are, who are voiceless. Thank so that you. was to fulfill a promise I made a while ago. Thank you. And of course, we also have Terry Chapman, who needs no introduction. Um, Terry is the program manager for the Economic Development Program at ORF America, and she's also the co-chair of the Kigali Global Dialogue. Um, so let's start. Um, Iriani, I was thinking, let's start with you. So I was very interested in the paper that you recently wrote. Um, we know that the pandemic exacerbated multiple and intersecting vulnerabilities. It also exposed um, all of the failures of the current global health architecture. Now, even before the pandemic, calls to decolonize global health were getting louder, more frequent. So I have two questions for you here. One, what do we really mean by decolonizing global health? Are we all even talking about the same thing when we um, call to decolonize global health? And the second thing is, if we do decolonize global health, what would the new global health architecture look like? So over to you. Thank you, Vidisha. That's a very good question. So our current neoliberal paradigm restricts the policy space to address and combat health inequities. So basically what, what it means is that it's focusing a lot of individual responsibility as not looking at all at the social determinants of health, which is more upstream. So this, what, what this means is that policymakers may also frame inequities such that they become difficult to address via interventions. And this allows them to relinquish any responsibility for citizens' health and to restrict um, investments in health, especially in the global south. So what I want to say is that to combat this, we need to apply and use feminist principles in all aspects of policymaking and also our lives. So and recognizing that this is a prerequisite for um, uh, broader goals like uh, sustainable development. Uh, a decolonized and feminist uh, global health agenda, what it would look like would mean centering women, girls, and marginalized communities uh, right up front, right up center. So with feminist health agenda, we wouldn't have seen what we saw during this pandemic, which was um, countries from the global north racing to uh, using the economic power and political leverage to buy up uh, vaccines at the cost of others, the lives of others, actually, essentially. The asymmetry in epistemic power that you mentioned, Vidisha, so basically it reproduces the colonial cleavages that you see historically, um, the in interactions between the global north and global south. And this power asymmetry must be addressed to increase rep representation and leadership of people, of, of local authors, people who are also in LMICs. But unfortunately, unfortunately we have seen this asymmetry uh, shaping the response to the pandemic. And so what happens was, it was perpetuating a worldview that does not take into account the needs of countries in LMICs. Uh, and, and, and converse, what we didn't see was that uh, success stories like in Ghana, Senegal, Kerala, and India, we, they were not lifted up when actually they should have been. Thanks, Ayani. Um, so I think that that sort of what you said is really important. It, a, a global health architecture that is decolonial has uh, feminist principles at the heart of it would really be about people and communities. I think that is an entry point to uh, what I wanted to speak about next. If health systems are really about people at the end, um, pandemic responses need to put people at the forefront. We know um, what happened during COVID. It wasn't just um, COVID itself, but also um, essential health services were disrupted for many people. So, um, Terry, you went through um, a lot over the pandemic, uh, not just the pandemic. So I just want to hand over to you um, in case you would like to share what your experience was like. Thank you, Vidisha. Um, 
as we kind of come out of the pandemic and we start, you know, we have an opportunity to rethink and we're sort of forced to rethink things like our healthcare system, um, but also sort of how we're negotiating things like our workspaces, our community spaces and things like that. I think we have to kind of take seriously the equity question. So I'm going to share a personal story um, specific to kind of the pandemic and then how we kind of how it relates to needing to rethink how we engage with spaces and how we can make health spaces more equitable. So uh, fat, uh, rewind to August 2019. I was here in Kigali um, at the inaugural edition of the Kigali Global Dialogue. And I walked up onto, sta onto the stage to give the opening remarks. Um, and I was carrying with me this kind of secret, this sort of burden that nobody in the audience kind of knew about. And that was sort of the knowledge that this might be kind of the last time that I got to speak in public. And fast forward three months later, it was about, I don't know, September, October. And I was deep into chemotherapy at that time. And my, my immune system was severely depleted, um, which is common for chemo patients. And fast forward till March, I think it was the 10th. I had just gone through a major surgery and I was in the recovery room. And I saw the nurses rushing around and they were sort of pasting these, uh, these signs on the walls. And at first it said like, okay, you know, you can have one guest uh, per day come and visit you. Because normally you could just have come, people come and see you. And then a few hours later, they take the sign down and they say, okay, you can have one guest for one hour who can come. It's like, okay. And then, you know, a few hours later, another sign would come up with say like, no guest can come and see you. And of course, this was when the pandemic had started. And on March 12th, I think it was, Angela Merkel made her first kind of major announcement about the pandemic and the lockdowns and sort of the, the severity of the situation, which hadn't really been that clear. So over the, the next few months, uh, I went through lots of radiation, more chemotherapy, surgeries, et cetera. And of course, that takes a toll on your immune system. Um, and I think I had been in isolation, you know, long before the pandemic had even hit. Before we even knew what it was, it was kind of like a common cold could be life-threatening. And so the pandemic comes along and uh, common spaces for everyone became a danger, right? Everyone was scared to go to the supermarket. Everyone was scared to go to... You know, you couldn't even go into your schools, you couldn't go into your community uh, spaces, you couldn't, you know, do things. And then for people like myself, it was much more of a risk and it remains a risk, right? We don't, it's difficult to quantify it. It's difficult to know how much of a risk you have. But I think we have sort of forgotten about a lot of people as we move out of the pandemic. We've forgotten about people who are immunocompromised. We've forgotten about older folks, people who haven't been able to reintegrate in the same way. And I think you know, as someone who's experienced this myself, it's very difficult um, because maybe you don't always fit a profile. It's not always obvious that you might be at an increased risk. In my office, people are like, okay, you have to be in the office. And it's like, well, if you're not wearing masks, maybe not, you know? So I think it's an opportunity. It's a chance for us to, to think about health equity in the post-pandemic period from a new way, that we can rethink our spaces. We can rethink our community spaces, our offices, our schools to make them more inclusive, to make them more accessible, to make them kind of more inclusive of people who we might have just not even thought about. And I think this is the opportunity. And just my experience is kind of one that I think illustrates that a little bit, that you know, it's not always obvious when people might not have access to things, who might not have access to spaces. But if we can think about that as we renegotiate these things, renegotiate relationships with spaces, how we um, how we engage in community areas and things like that, I think it's an important um, an important thing to remember. Thank you, Terry, for sharing that and for for sharing your story with all of us because that's essentially what it is. We speak about health systems, but it really is made up of people and individual stories. Um, and you're the face of uh, a very important story. Uh, what you highlighted is so important. Um, if the pandemic had one silver lining, and I say this very carefully because the the amount of loss that we've seen over the last two years is, is really unprecedented in some ways. But if it has one silver lining, perhaps it is this, um, that we know that there, there are things that we need to do differently. Um, we know that they can be done differently because before the pandemic, um, we uh, so many things that are now uh, taken for granted and are digital were never made digital for people with physical um, disabilities and challenges have been saying for years that you know uh, the our physical environment is not 
comfortable and you need to do things differently but we never did them till the pandemic happened and suddenly we did so we know now that there are things that need to be done different um so yani going back to what you were saying if um i had to if i asked you to tell me the one thing that we definitely need to leave behind um based on all that we have learned over the last two years if there's one thing that we need to leave behind and if there's one thing that we need to do more of going forward uh, whether that's rooted in feminist principles or otherwise what would those two things be i need to leave behind would be the acceptance of how global health um Uh, is research is taking place right now global health in, in itself as a framework to accept it as it is because why are we not questioning the legitimacy and the power in the current structure i think we need to question that and the good thing that we need to do more of would be to make sure there's more representation um in terms of research and also um in terms of the leadership so what does it mean so basically using universities as a place to do subversion of global health and and when you do teaching uh, and lifting up examples from the global south for example this is over the long term one way to fight inequities uh, all the isms you can think of colonialism imperialism racism this inequities that uh, this inequities that you speak, spoke of um just now as well uh, all these things should should not be happening in the future and terry um going back to what you were saying about renegotiating spaces uh so as an individual for you what what is it that you think going forward is something that you would um uh, you would like to reiterate yeah i mean i think we have to think about health as something that's much much broader than the healthcare systems right and the pandemic has made that clear to a lot of us that there are health implications for all kinds of things and and i think that's the thing that we need to remember is that health is so much more than healthcare systems and um and and spaces and accessibility of spaces is now kind of part of that um and making them safe and conducive for people um and the second thing i would say is i think uh we also have to think about health as as you mentioned uh as something that people experience and we have to remember that people are at the center of all of this that we're trying to create whether it is a healthcare system whether it's a more just uh global health architecture we really have to sometimes not all the time but sometimes bring it back to the individuals i think we should always bring it back to the individuals and and that's and that's, that's why fair. i think these independence principles is so key because people who are marginalized who are not taken care of not accounted for feminism will place these people like yourself terry right at the center thank you both so much um i suppose the future of the global health architecture is um, also made up of people like us um and it's so great that we've started these conversations and uh, look forward to building onto this in other conversations thank you all for joining thank us you. thank you